All right, now you should be able to see my browser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I see. Exercise mm -hmm. seven. Yeah, I, that's the wrong tab. Now do you see dimensional reduction tech methods? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we started, we left off last time with the, in the book with 6.3. So the first part, just a quick review and for myself too, just to kind of put myself uh, oh. in, uh, what do you call it? Orient, orient myself. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we talked about linear model selection, subset selection was first part shrinkage methods using ridge and lasso was the second part. And now this is a, yet another technique, uh, they call it dimensional reduction. Um, and it does reduce the dimension of the problem, but it doesn't actually have the nice advantage of being easy to interpret because you still have all the parameters involved. They're just different linear combinations, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So what you do is you transform the predictors into some linear combination predictors, but hopefully you can find less of these linear combinations than you had originally, M less than P, you know, less of the Zs than you had originally of the Ps. So, and that's really just to make the model less flexible. That's the only real purpose of doing that so that it has less variance, right? Um, so the, the person who did this section before we went through all the math of how you get from, you know, you start with this equation for the Z as some linear combination, phi is some matrix, right? That's a matrix transformation of the original predictors. And he works through the math to see what the betas are transformed according, right? So the, the old betas, the old um, um, coefficients, right, of the fit, are now constrained because they're now some linear combination of these new thetas, which are the new parameters of the fit. Theta is the coefficient for the z's, right? I mean, this is this is, this is right out of the book. There's nothing. I, it's, it's a lot of symbols, but it's basically the idea is you're just making a linear combination of the old uh, parameters, right? Or the old sorry, the old predictors to make these new predictors, and that puts constraints on the uh, original coefficients for the model. So it can increase bias, but more importantly, it increases variance by making a less flexible model. So you can avoid overfitting, right? That's the goal here. Um, th these are particularly useful when you have a lot of parameters and the number of parameters is very close or more than the number of uh, data you actually collected, right? So there's two kinds of techniques. The book, just, the book, I would say fortunately, because it's like a lot in this chapter. So I'm fortunate, I'm glad, I'm grateful, I should say that they, didn't spend a lot of time on this dimensional reduction. They kind of like made a little bit of, a little bit more black box than, than some of the other systems, right? So the PCA is just, you know, hey, here it is. It's something called principal component analysis. How exactly you do it, we're not going to tell you, but it tries to choose these new parameters, um, these new coordinates where most of the variance <coughs> is captured in the first parameters, right? So as much of the variance is captured in the first parameter, and then the next whatever's left over, the next parameter, and so on. That's what this is saying, basically. Did that make sense to everybody when they read it? I thought it made sense to me, like, in a high level. But they also mm -hmm. said more in Chapter 12. So I'm like, okay, good. I won't have to, like, <laughs> worry too much if I don't fully understand it, right? Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, so. it seemed, when, seemed kind of short. but Yeah. Yeah, yeah and when they said um, variance, at first I was confused. But I think they just mean, for example, population has a larger range right of values so therefore it is a dimension with the most variance in this well it's not just it's the point is like the the purple dots here are the all the the data right and yeah. so the green line is the first principal component that they mm -hmm. they find and it's the one where the, mm -hmm. you can see obviously there's the most variance it almost looks like a fit of ad spending ad spending versus population and maybe that's how you Correct. do it but they didn't really tell yeah. us that but it's the direction of which there's the most variance and the second then you, the next component is going to be orthogonal to that by Right. right. In this case, it's so only direction, two, so it's easy. But when there's more, you have you have to do like a Graham Schmidt type thing, right? I assume, right? Okay. Keep, but then, you know. what do you mean by variance? So distance to yeah, the, how much wiggling there point. is. <laughs> so the most wiggling you can capture with the green line. That's the point, right? Most wait, sorry. What well, can you repeat that? I said that you can capture the most wiggling with that green line. You know, the most variance, the most spread, right? Got it. Yeah. 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 Okay. When considering like both dimensions, to... yeah. 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 And then this is only showing you two dimensions and more dimensions. You can't easily draw it, but the mat, the, the software does, does it for you basically. Right. Mm -hmm. and I assume that we'll learn more about how that's done in chapter 12 or maybe it's somewhere else, it, or we can go look it up if we really care. Um, to me, it's like, I'm just, I'm happy just to know it exists. And if I ever need to use this, I'll come back and dig into it more <laughs> kind of thing. Right. Yeah, I'm just looking at it now. Yeah, there are, there's a whole section. Oh, there is. Okay. Let's see, it's like one, two, three, four, five pages. So, yeah, it seems a little bit better. Yeah. 
So they show it, this is the, uh, they show, oh, these next two plots just show it broken down another way. So the green line, you can see how far away uh, the dots are from the green line. That's like kind of the residual, right? So it does, I think it is sort of like a fit, but it's orthogonal residuals in some sense. I don't know, anyway, maybe I think we need too much into it. And the point is that the new coordinate Z1 is now uh, a linear combination of the population and the ad revenue, right? Ad spending. Mm -hmm. And the second component has almost got nothing left by it at that point, it turns out in this data set. It's almost flat. And so, okay, they they did some example of that with some uh, test data, right? Because they have test MSC and here's the most used test data. And they show, yeah, as the uh, number of components. So it's, it's kind of neat. I mean, you started with like a couple, a few components that captures most of the variance. And so, yeah, quickly the test error can come down. Um, that's the pink line right here quickly come down and then you still you only use like at this point looks like four components and you've already captured you as best you can the the model but that's the advantage it really does mitigate this overfitting by reducing the number of variables um there is a uh, i guess one of the one of the disadvantages like i said before it's not a feature selection method so all these new components still depend on all the p's so it doesn't really help you with interpreting the model like rigid like uh lasso does but it's, they say here it's more like rigs and lasso, and that that's, seems to make sense to me. There is an assumption, though, and the assumption is that the directions in which the predictors vary uh, are also directions associated with the variation of y, but PCR doesn't actually look at y at all. It just only looks at x, except when you do the fit, of course, but you see what I mean. Uh, and so when that assumption is not true, it doesn't do... Uh, when assumption is true, PCR does very well. Like in this example, when it's not true, it may not work as well. And that's this example shown next. Um, this is that simulated data, simulated data they used before where they had like just random predictors. And in this case, the variance really has nothing to do with the, um, actually really has nothing to do with it because it's just randomly generated. They're all uncorrelated Gaussians. Um, and the PCR, you know, the PCR does uh, reduce, it does better than, um, so the, at the far right of both these plots is ordinarily squares. You have all the components. It doesn't matter that you've used different linear combinations, it's still all components. So it certainly improves on, the uh, mean squared error over ordinarily squared, but it's not a very dramatic improvement, right? And, and even worse, it's true. So I think it's funny about this case is that on the right, the left hand, okay, so these are both generally using 50 observations, right? Random observations with 45 predictors on the left. On the right is 50 observations, only five predictors, or no, it's only two predictors. You would think, oh, this piece actually do great by only need two predictors, but it actually does terrible. <laughs> so I don't know why that is, but I think it's because the variations aren't strongly correlated correlate, uh, correlate with Y, so the PCR doesn't work as well. That's what the text says. I don't, I don't, I have to admit they're not fully grokking that completely. I don't know if you have any in, insight on that, you guys, but but that's what I got out of the text. It'd be like, oh, it's if you have um, because the X's aren't strongly correlate correlated with Y, and they're not in this case, because again, the the predictors are completely random and they're not, you know, at all correlated. Uh, then the PCR doesn't do as well, isn't as effective. Yeah, I mean, maybe just because like you're, I don't know, the PCR is kind of like, um, I don't know, just thinking through it intuitively, like it, it's identifying common variants, like the kind of strongest signal yeah. across across a bunch of variables. And if that signal is you know if, if that is related to why then then it's going to improve things because you're honing in on that signal or that like underlying representation right <laughs> like the the underlying thing that you're trying to get at that might be captured partially by many variables you know um yeah, yeah okay yeah that makes sense to me yeah. So one way to use one way to improve on that what in those cases is to use this partial least squares where y is involved. It's called supervised method. And now I now I'm now looking at the title of chapter two at 12, I understand why they say supervised, because it's clear that the other one is an unsupervised because it doesn't use y, and that's chapter 12's title. So it makes sense that it's in there. But the partial least squares is a supervised method. And in that one, what you do is you actually basically uh, you fit the data, right? And then you use that fit as your first coordinate, and then you subtract that, you use the residuals from that to fit the next or the next uh, coordinates after that. Uh, it's what I remembering my <laughs> what I remember from reading the text. I don't have it in front of me, so it's something like that, right? 
Mm-hmm. You guys remember this section? Now they think about it, like what? Uh, barely. I I had never heard it, hadn't heard of partial least squares before. Um, they, but yeah. Um, let's just take a look real quick here for a sec. Tell me what they said here. Partial least squares, right? So yeah. First, you compute the first direction by setting each of the coordinates uh, equal to the coefficients from the simple linear regression. So that's the first direction, Z1. And then Z2 is computed by subtract, uh, adjusting each of the, uh, adjusting all the rest of the variables for Z1 by regressing every variable on a Z1 and then taking the residuals from that. Okay, I get you. Essentially, it's some kind of like orthogonalization, right? After you, uh, for each direction after that, whatever's left over on the residuals. I'm not explaining that very well, but I don't understand it very well, so it all makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm rereading that part again too. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. What do they mean by regressing each variable on Z1 and taking residuals? They mean using Z1 yeah. as if it was the response. Ah, uh, got it. Okay. Yeah. Well, that helps a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Um, before, like when I was in, uh, like, uh, in like a research, like academic type setting, um, PCA or, or, uh, yeah, PCA, um, uh, like it, um, or PCR, sorry, right now, PCA, PCA. Yeah. Sorry, I'm getting confused with all the, the PCs. I know. Um, yeah. PCA, like, um, like, like people were mostly doing that to, to, because they're interested in like the loadings like they're interested in like um a lot of the time at least from what i saw like where people were saying you know they would construct some kind of measurement and they would have like um a bunch of a bunch of questions that are supposed to re represent some underlying concept and they want to see that like which questions are loading on which principal component um and then then, then they would like call it something like 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 uh working memory or whatever um ah, okay and and they would like name it they would like name the the component based on that underlying construct that they're trying to like get at but like each question kind of gets at a slightly different somewhat overlapping sliver of it okay so they um, would find some way to make some kind of interpretation out of it then exactly That's cool. exactly That's yeah cool. yeah but i feel like Partially squares feels weird to me because like it doesn't do that, right? You're not going to get that kind of interpretation out of it because it's like being aligned to, to the data to your, to to the your response, outcome. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then I don't know, here it says it's not often not better than ridge or or yeah, uh, so why bother? <laughs> I guess I don't know. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Just use ridge. No. Uh, yeah, but, I agree. But I guess, sorry, I, I, I just realized this um in the chapter when I was fooling around with the uh with the uh, terminology just now. So this is actually in this chapter, they talk about principal components regression. So it is, it is. Yes. Or do they, PCR, do they have, yeah. do they have they do oh, they did have a section on PCA. Okay, too, okay, yeah. sorry. Um, I, I but think PCR, the PCA leaves the PCR, yeah. But PCR is is regression on- Using the PCA, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. PCs. okay. <laughs> Using the PCs, the principal components, yeah. Got it, got it, got it. Okay. So I, one other thing I want to talk about this partial least squares. If you work, did you guys work through a laboratory, the lab? Yeah. Um, a little bit of it. I did like I'm the subsetting, yeah. like the subsetting stuff. Yeah, I mm -hmm. I did do the lab. Man, is it long? Woof! It's <laughs> it's <a little> long. <laughs> so I, did, I got to the lab and I did a couple exercises and that was it. I'm like, okay, that's enough of this chapter. I'm moving on with my life. But uh, yeah. the lab is really long. But one thing I did learn from the lab is when they have you do the partial least squares. Almost every time you do it, it, only one component ever matters is because the first fit. Because most of these things are like, and I, so I, Google, I, I had to, um, I looked that up. I should have saved the link, but I looked up on the stack and chain, stack, uh, uh, what do you call it? The, what do you call that stupid thing? Yeah, Cross validated. Cross validated, yeah, yeah. And um, so many comments on this. Yeah, if there's only if the if the underlying model only has one like noise source, right? Then the PCR, the partially square is only the first component is going to really matter. It's going to capture everything because mm. basically the ordinary mm -hmm. linear regression, and the rest of them should be very should be zero basically, hmm. or should be unimportant. I guess I would say uh, not necessary, right? 
And that's, that is what happens in the, uh, in the laboratory, especially when you do simulated data where clearly there's only one January and the data, you know, the, um, anyway, you'll see when you do the lab, I don't want to, I'm not doing, doing it justice by trying to say it. Actually, let me just see if I have my, in my notes here about this. Oh, I'm actually hard to find. Is it in this? No, it's a good PLS. Not. All right, I'm not going to try to find it in real time. So anyway, um, there basically you found, what I found was that the, during the partial least square is you only really get the first component from systems unless there really is like multiple noise generators in a system. Oh, I should find the uh, that link and you guys can, here it is. Let's copy this link. Well, you can see my writing out there, but I will put it in the chat. Mm -hmm. For your own amusement. Cool. Oops. I don't know where I just pasted that to. Okay, there you go. Thanks. Yeah, oh. somebody else said, why does it always keep getting one component? <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so that's the that's the, the dimensional reduction technique. The next, the last section of the chapter is just about considerations for higher dimensions, and the, the issue there again is like, oh, okay, when you have like a large number of predictors, when you have even less data than predictors, linear regression is just going to memorize the data, right? So they give a quick example here. Here's a, here's a bit of mm -hmm. y versus x. You have a lot of data, right? You, you've got a, a, a line. There's noise around the line, so the, it's not memorizing the data. There's going to be some variance on it when you it with other data, right? Whereas if you only had two data points, that's exactly determines the line. So just all you're doing is memorizing the data. Uh, so it won't obviously any it's going to have high var very the highest possible variance, and any it's going to have poor predicting ability, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, that was a super simple like example, but yeah. uh, with the two point thing, but but it it really solidified for me with the the n equals p uh, yeah type of scenario. Yeah. And then think about when n is. Uh, less than p if only at one point you can't where's the line i don't know i don't have enough information right so <laughs> yeah it could be any slope um so they recommend uh so they recommend all the stuff we learned in this chapter can help with that right the dimensional reduction lasso anything that reduces the flexibility is going to help um and they say it's uh important to choose good tuning parameters of course um the cursor dimensionality is mentioned in this section that any features that aren't associated with Y just increase the test. These bullet points seem to be out of order. Uh, associated with the Y increase the test error. That's that cursor dimensionality we've discussed before, right? Because you're fitting the noise, right? In the training. Um, and they, they just caution you again, to remind you never use the training MSE or p values or anything else like that as evidence of goodness of fit because they're going to be just widely different from your test. They're going to be basically meaningless at that point when you have a lot more parameters than, or you have more greater than or equal to yeah parameters that are greater than or equal to the number of uh test points you have that all seemed pretty clear to me i think um so that's that's just kind of a summary of that section it really needs um to read it of course but <laughs> anyone have any other comments on that section about higher dimensions anything else you took away from that other than that i mean and that and that would be true for any any model right yeah um, yeah, I guess like in some models, like parameters can be like kind of hidden. So it might be hard to tell, you know, like how much <clears throat> how much flexibility you have or how much you're you're really training, you know, when you're um doing that. Like yeah, I don't that's know. That's a good like, observation. Like can you is it always obvious like how many parameters you're tuning, you know? Like in right. the, obviously in regression it is, but but like with you know a neural net or something like um are you is it always clear you know how many how yeah many i don't I, I don't think so i mean I think that's one of the reasons why it's so important to have this uh test set mm -hmm. uh training set division right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that's basically the chapter now um Kevin, you asked me about uh, exercise seven, so I just want to spend a minute on that, if I, if you don't mind. That would um, be great. Yeah, and I, I I have some questions on other questions too, but okay, uh, great. Yeah, 
I know we called out this one and I looked at it and I was like, I'm not sure where to start with this. So uh, yeah, this- Well, I'll try to, try to see if I can walk through it. So the basic idea is this is our model, right? Each data point, this is the generating model, so to speak, of the data, right? So this is kind of underneath, underneath everything. This is our assumption is that each data point is generated by this line, right? Um, with these unknown coefficients, beta, uh, and these predictors, right? And then plus some irreducible error, right? And the assumption is that the irreducible error is IID from a normal distribution of variance sigma squared in the exercise, right? Okay. Uh, and so what is the likelihood function for that? Well, we're, what you're saying when you say that is you're saying, oh, each variable, each data, each uh, response, data point is normally distributed then, right? With the mean given by the first part of this thing, beta zero plus this sum of beta sub j, x i j, right? Uh, and the variance is given by sigma squared or standard deviation sigma. Which I put here on this line, the likelihood is proportional to this, right? Which is just uh, Gaussian, right? Multivariable Gaussian. Mm -hmm. Right, it won't matter in the end. Sorry, you're breaking off a little bit. Are you? Uh, I see that you? my internet connection has become unstable. Yeah, uh, I missed some of it. But is that so? Is that the likelihood function for uh, right? So it's just Gaussian? a normal distribution. Yeah, Gaussian. Oh, okay. I mean, I see. what I was saying before was it's Gaussian because the statement of the problem is that the the predictors are given by this mm -hmm. this line or not line, but this linear. Uh, relationship plus some noise that's, that's normal distributed. Therefore, the, the data points are going to be normally distributed, right? Mm -hmm. The responses are going to be normally distributed about this mean, which is beta zero. This Just this part is the mean, right? right? Oh, I put it right, right here, right. mean u, right? Do you see when I highlight these things or just make a mask? Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's the likelihood. That's the like the key step, I think, in this exercise to recognize that part of it. <laughs> So this one over two times uh, the, what is it? The variance yeah. squared, um, that, is that from the likelihood? That's uh, just from a normal function? distribution. That's, that, I just uh -huh. just copied that out of the what a normal distribution uh -huh. is. Got it, got right? it. Okay. Yeah. A normal okay. distribution, that's where you put the variance in a normal distribution, right? That, that determines how tight the normal distribution is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then okay. you, they told us that the priors were of this, um, I guess I didn't put it in, but the prize of this form down here, right? This exponential, double exponential, they call it, right? This e to the minus absolute value of beta over some parameter b. And so you just, yep. you don't, you just do the thing. Okay, I want to know the probability, I want to know the posterior, probability of beta is given the data. I just turn that around, probably the data given the beta times my priors, right? And there's some normalization constant, which is, you know, non-trivial, but not important for this because we don't we only care about things that depend on beta because in the end, we're going to look for the, we're going to look for the mode of this distribution. So to find the mode, we don't have to do anything. We don't have to do any integrals. We have to find the, the normal. We don't have to uh, normalize this, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you do Bayesian data analysis, finding that normalization constant is the hard part when you really want the whole distribution. But if you just want to know the the op, the, the mode, it's not such a hard problem. Mm -hmm. And so here is the, um, so you, you just do that multiplication. I multiply the likelihood times the prior, which is the product of all these exponentials, right? That's the assumption in the problem. And mm -hmm. now all you got to do is expand, you know, take those, uh, combine those exponentials together. Right? You know how that works. E to the A times E to the B is E to the A plus B, right? That's like, mm -hmm. uh, properties of exponentials. And this is what you get for the posterior then, this equation down here. That product just becomes a sum in the exponent, right? Mm -hmm. This is all clear at this point. Just jump yeah, in if you yeah. have questions. I don't. I mean, I may have skipped a step or something. I only just did this about half an hour ago. <laughs> oh, you did! Wow. Yeah. Okay. I did it for you, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. No, I. Um, I assume that you would. That would be the first one you would have gone after because uh, we were talking about it at the end of last. I did do it, but I just did it on paper, so I just put it in oh, the way so you can oh, see it better. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. No, I then, think it makes sense so far. Um, yeah. So yeah. then you just need to find the mode of this distribution, which is where it's maximum, right? And where this is maximum is where the exponent is maximized, which means you just have to minimize this. I just took out the minus sign. You have to minimize this, right, uh -huh. to find the mode. 
as a function of beta. And if I multiply through by two sigma squared, it just make it this, then it looks exactly as the form in the book for um, uh, lasso, right? This is exactly what you do for the lasso. Mm -hmm. That's basically the, the, the only thing you have to do. You can do exactly the same thing for the, um, the normally distributed betas, priors, right? The e to the minus beta squared over 2c. That's the description of the problem, right? You just do the same steps and you just come up with the, uh, the, the ridge regression. It's just exactly the same kind of thing. And that's it. That's all there is to it. Oh, the only other comment is that for the ridge regression, uh, the mode is also the mean, and that's only because it's uh, it's a multinomial distribution in beta as well, right? Because the, the it's uh, it's quadratic in the beta, so you can factor it into a multinomial distribution in beta, mm -hmm. much like you do in. Oh no, never mind. Never mind. That's a different book. <laughs> Very cool. Um, yeah. So that's that's exercise seven. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's great. Um, can you say more about the normalization part and like the mode? So you said that, um, like something like it, you don't need to worry about normalization because you're just trying to estimate the mode. Uh, right. So in the posterior, right, I I can write down the shape of the, the shape of the posterior is given by this, uh -huh. right? For example, this one, that's the shape of the posterior. But I said I just have proportional to because I don't know the normalization. Uh -huh. I guess I guess I could have written it down for this particular case. I mean, there was all the factors were known, but um, it's not important, right? I don't need to know it to find just where the, where's the posterior, the maximum. I don't care about the uh, I see, I see. things that don't depend on beta. Like you don't care about the the scale, only the yeah. relative. Uh, yeah. Right. Cause, yeah, I'm going to find where the slope is zero or something like that, right? So I, yeah, I don't right. care about that. But if and, I really and, want to know the full distribution of the betas in the, like you normally do actually in Bayesian data analysis, you want to actually know that posterior distribution, not just the mode, then you do need to know that normalization. And that's why you need things like Monte Carlo Markov chain, because sometimes that new, that denominator, that normalization is a mat, is, is intractable basically. And it would be the probability of data, right? Yeah, probably no, probably the parameters given the data. Right, but in like in like, sorry, I'm just thinking of the uh, above where you had probability of uh, like in, yeah. in the denominator, wouldn't it be probability of data? Oh, yes, probability of yeah. data, exactly right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Sorry, yes, exactly right. Okay, yeah, and that's that's hard to right, but there's no beta in that, so I don't care for finding the most, yeah. yeah, yeah, but yeah. You yeah, do yeah. need to know it to know right. the full distribution, right? Right, right, okay, okay. Yeah, I was definitely not going to get this, but uh, this is fantastic. Um, I think you should put this in the chapter notes um, somehow, like make an exercise section or something. Oh, yeah, yeah I can do that. I, I agree. Share. Why not? Yeah, this is awesome work. Yeah. Um, so you had done it. Uh, you had done it, but you just wrote it on paper. Yeah. Like, Translated to latex. It's good practice for me because I'm uh, trying to get better at doing the the law tech and the mm -hmm. markdowns. Still not that great. I I don't I keep using regular parentheses and so the, the parentheses don't look as great if you use like the the law tech L paren or whatever it is or what is it a, a right L angle and R angle. What do you think you're supposed to use? No, what are these supposed to use? Anyway, I'm still learning. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And and uh, sorry at the bot the last the line where you said after multiplying through by two times what's that greek letter uh sigma sigma squared um yeah. which is the variance right variance right. squared um uh sorry yeah the variance um so you said it's the same thing as lasso and that's because the beta is is not squared right and just yeah some constant so if you look at that uh 6.7 you'll see it looks exactly right. like this except Instead of two sigma squared over beta, it's just got lambda. So lambda like, is two sigma squared over beta. That's all. But like two sigma squared over beta is just some constant. That yeah, beta is a b. I'm sorry, two sigma squared over b is lambda. But b yeah. is also arbitrary in here. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So just it could just be represented. Yeah. As lambda. yeah, yeah, exactly right. There, that's awesome. Cool. And at that point, I you know open it up to uh, bring your own problem section of the. Thing. Mm -hmm. I will stop sharing for now. Cool. Um, 
Uh oh, see that my notes. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, I did I did try part of the lab. Uh, I I started on I started on the exercises first, so I wanted to get some of those out of the way. But um, maybe I could just talk about the lab real quick. The this this subsetting function from leaps, this reg subsets. Yeah. I struggled with for a little bit because like I was making, I was doing that exercise. Oh, maybe this is the applied exercise actually. Um, I think it's the first applied exercise. And one thing I couldn't get to, to start and I saw it at the end of the, of let's say seven or no, sorry, eight, eight C. They say um, you will need to use the data frame function to create a single data set containing both X and Y. I kept on trying it with like, a single predictor and then in the formula doing all of the polynomial stuff um and it kept on complaining that there weren't more than two dimensions and i was like i was just being driven nuts and then i realized i think you have to what they mean i think you have to make like an x an x squared an x cubed yeah. like you have to make each one actually explicit in the data set um you're talking uh, about eight exercise eight yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what um there was a shortcut for doing that. Uh I, let me see. I think I actually did that one. Is there a poly it's like a poly function? Yeah, poly, but you put raw equals true, so it doesn't otherwise poly is gonna make um orthogonal polynomials. It's not gonna it's not gonna do X. Um okay. Yeah, so I ended up doing that actually with tidy models because I knew that there was uh, a poly function there. Um, but it's I think it's the same thing. Um let me just uh, open it up. Yeah, in tiny models, they have step poly. Um, and then you just write in, uh, hold on, I can share my screen one second. Yeah. Um, and I tried to do it in Quarto, so I have I was playing around with that. Um, oh, cool. Um, I, I, have to get, I have to get on that too. Let me, yeah, it's the first time I'd really done much with it, but um, yeah, so this is, I love this visual editor too. Um, I was I was fooling around with these like uh, these uh, note boxes um, too. Uh, anyway, just trying to like figure out what the best way to um, neat. I haven't uh, done any of that yet. Represent it, but that. and they have these like these callouts and stuff. Anyway, cool. Getting carried away, but um the Why not? yeah where is it? Um, so I was doing so. <laughs> Excuse me stuff there that wasn't useful but then okay so yeah here so you just do step poly and then the variable and then you say what degree it is and then you it'll just include all of the polynomials in your um I see you're like your, mixing and matching your pipe types is that intentional or is it just oh it's because I think I copied this part oh, okay. from, uh, from the tidy models labs uh I see. that's on github and then and then I wrote this part so uh, okay the stuff I've been writing, I've been using the new pipe. So, yeah. I don't know. I, I'm actually not that familiar with the tiny model, but I just started learning a little bit on the side. I'm like, now they, mm -hmm. no, now there's a new pipe thing. I'm like, oh, I, th I thought maybe there was a reason for it. Like, oh, it does, the new pipe doesn't work on this other thing or whatever. No, yeah. It, you know, it works. Uh, I just, I, I, now when I see the McGritter pipe, I like think, I, I think it's like, I don't know. It just looks odd to me. You're um, like, okay, boomer. <laughs> yeah. That's a boomer yeah. pipe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but, but yeah, so it's like similar, I think, right. You just, you, I guess that argument might be different that you were mentioning the orthogonal, the orthogonal thing. Um, or what was it? Raw data or something. Yeah. It's, you just um, use poly. Um, and then, but you put the, you know, extra argument raw equals true. So then it won't, it won't find orthogonal ones. Oh, I see. Otherwise, it automatically does orthogonal polynomials, and I don't think that was the intent. I'm not mm -hmm. sure, but I don't think that was the intent. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So I don't think that is the step. There. The step poly does orthogonal so it, ones or not? Not. I don't think it does okay. orthogonal. And sorry, what do you? I'm not sure what you mean by orthogonal. Well, poly in the uh, raw in the base R or the. Uh, I don't know what you call it. Well, anyway, in the in the uh, base R formula language, does um, uh, if you just say poly x ten, it won't give you x x squared x cubed. But it'll, it'll start with it'll give you orthogonal polynomials, which means that each one is or each like the first one will be like x, second one maybe like x squared minus one half x or something like that. I don't oh, know if they're yeah. orthogonal. Were they Chebyshev? I think or something. Anyway, there's some. Oh yeah, definitely not. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it does like 
yeah just one to ten yeah in this case yeah um but but yeah so i think what i i don't know if i did this correctly but what i found in that exercise is that um is that just so this is with lasso um just the first just the kind of first exponent was the one that oh, it looks like i'm sorry it does look like step poly does take the raw equals true as well uh -huh, uh -huh. otherwise it does do orthogonal i'm just looking at the documentation it does or doesn't it does, oh, it does. Default. yeah orthogonal okay. is generally what you i guess you want for it fits better because they're all independent uh, uh, okay. the, the, right because they're independent so when you fit if you fit one co one coordinate changes the other ones won't necessarily uh -huh. so when this is saying poly one poly two poly three it's not just x to the fourth x to the fifth um it, it, there's another term in there that yeah um to that's make it more orthogonal. It orthogonal okay okay yeah interesting okay um but yeah i found here that it was just the first degree one polynomial that was uh kept and the other ones were dropped out with the lasso um but but yeah there's really some really nice um tiny models there's like this this lasso fit uh if you you take out the fitted object um you can see like i guess like these the different predictors and how oh. their coefficient value so basically what they had in the book with like yeah showing it across different uh levels of lambda um you know when they when they all start to drop out and then this one very nice here, I guess, is the one, the first, the first uh, polynomial um, that kind of is capped all the way until you max out on lambda. Um, but, but yeah, um, so I had very little patience with doing the base R stuff. Like, I did all this, and then, but what you're saying is, I should, I should just do. Uh, so this is not even what Poly is doing. Um, so, yeah, I see. So raw equals so raw equals true false. would make or it true yeah, raw equals false is a default but raw equals true makes it just... okay right. yeah so like uh anyway yeah like, yeah i just need i gave names to my variables so that it was uh oh okay a little well, bit i see you did yeah easier to to remember what, what what they were um so you okay so raw equals false i see well uh, true is what you want oh it equals true. yes damn it i keep getting wrong um yeah uh, something that oh well, you didn't you didn't yeah library whatever uh, what is it uh i can't remember we, there it is yeah, we just, um yeah so let's see uh, i can't even see what the output is here anyway I don't know why the uh, summary didn't come out so the first so here it's the first um so for bic the first it's the same. So this agrees with uh, this backward selection. I think agrees with the cross-validated lasso okay. results. Um, oh, but R squared. Uh, or this would be min, or or this should be max actually. Yeah. Um, anyway, so um, I don't have much more to say on that problem, but um, yeah, just that I was frustrated <laughs> to get getting reg subsets to work properly yeah I, mean, I i agree with you about the base r stuff because this book i noticed in this especially like in this chapter and it's probably going to get worse you just like just start throwing things at you like wait a minute what is that actually doing like why is he taking elements of this or why is he got mm -hmm. this one mm -hmm. through 20 comma in there what what was wrong with just taking the raw value I'm like oh it's a sparse matrix well he didn't say anything about that so mm -hmm. you have to go up and hunt down how sparse matrices work if you really want to understand what's going on in this chapter sometimes or in the lab i mean right yeah yeah the lab is just some of it went over my head I'm like huh because i'm not i'm not an r person i'm only a, more of a python person so yeah. r is a second language for me <laughs> Bro yeah. I, I speak broken r <laughs> yeah so that yeah. was actually very helpful kevin thank you was it okay. See you walk through it yeah yeah um i don't know if everything i did was exactly how you should do it like i haven't done much with lasso and um but mm -hmm. It, it, the, that that lab that uh, Emil 
Hef, 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 uh, I don't know how you pronounce mm. his last name that he put mm -hmm. together for, tiny, for ISLR and tidy models. Um, yeah, yeah. It was really neat. Uh, that's why I got some of that code, but. I see, yeah. Uh, but it's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, yeah, I, I also, so I, I tried out number five in the conceptual, um, okay. the other, the other one with the car going up a hill, meaning, I guess, meaning that's hard. Um, what was that and one? so it's this question about ridge regression and lasso with correlated variables. Oh, right. Um, I didn't do that one. Yeah. I was wondering if anyone else tried it. Um, cause so what I end up doing, so they give you all these like constraints, right? They're like, you just have two predictors, two uh, observations, um, uh, X, so X, um, X one, one. So it's like the first observation for the first predictor and the second, let's see the, sorry, the, um, the first observation for the second predictor, they're equal each other as well as the second observation for the first predictor and the second observation for the second predictor equal each other as well. Um, and then they, so they give you all these constraints and they're like, write out ridge regression and optimization, and then do the same thing for lasso and argue that in ridge, the kind of the way you minimize that optimization is to make B1 equal B2. Um, and then in lasso, you get a bunch of different possible solutions where B1 don't have to be B2, I got equal to B equal to B2. Um, so anyway, what I ended up doing was like, I didn't think I got to a conclusion, but I think I got somewhere. Um, I basically set it up um, and kind of went through the two data points um, and did the sums and everything, and then sub like substituted in um, to so so that like they say like x one one plus x two one equals zero. So I like substituted in like negative x two one for x one one. Um, so that they would have consistent terms in each. And what I ended up seeing, I think, is that, um, and I wish I had done this in LaTeX. How do you, how do you pronounce it, LaTeX? Um, I don't know, I pronounce it LaTeX, LaTeX. I'm not actually sure. Yeah. Um, I I'll wish I had done it. I hope one of you guys would correct me. <laughs> I just have it on paper. But basically what I got, I got to a point where like, when you do it with the ridge optimization, the final thing I got, like the most reduced form looks like very you can like pretty much factor it if you assume that the um that the variables are like very correlated um because lambda is like small anyway it just becomes it looks like you can factor it um but with with lasso it looks a bit more convoluted and like not easily able to be factored um so i don't know that made me think that with ridge like like you just have like kind of one way of minimizing it um, with one beta. So I ended up with like a situation where I had Y1 minus beta one times X11 one one minus X12. Um, and then you just kind of want to minimize that. Um, whereas with lasso, it was like something much longer that that seemed like you you there there were, I don't know it just seemed like it was like it wasn't easy to factor and like there are multiple ways that you could get the smallest value um in that case so i don't know if that's interesting if you haven't done it, but but um but uh yeah i don't know okay. i i want to give it a good cool. shot so yeah yeah i would i didn't do that one but i might go, now that now that you Showing the path forward, maybe I will take a tack. Maybe I will try to tackle that one. Yeah. So I mean, so basically, like I just set up those two optimizations based on the formula. You know, the the, the right. chapter, and then and then assumed that B one equals B two in both cases, and show that in the ridge case, you get something that's like factorable and looks like you know you just you just have B one left over um, with you know, one term, one like factor, and you can like, I don't know, it just seems like you, you, there'd be one way to minim minimize that. And with the lasso, the, I don't know, it was, uh, yeah, something that is not as, uh, 
easily factorable into like one term. So, um, so anyway, it was the, it was the, the biggest effort I've given on a, on a, on a steep problem. On All here. right. <laughs> so, so I was proud of at least the, the effort I put out on it, but, um, so, you know, I wonder if this orthogonal polynomial thing is going to come up in your chapter. Seven. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I was also, uh, I was interested in this five question too, because I think we had this discussion last time where we were saying that maybe with like, like when you have collinearity um, occurring that like lasso might be more like noisy because like the variable that it drops could like vary with slight differences in the sample um if there's two variables that are highly correlated but like important for predicting right. outcome um and so I, I think they're trying to get at that that idea here um via like a simple like you know two observation situation where they're giving you a bunch of constraints um so yeah, if you're able to do it, you know, Sandra, you're able to do it. Um, it would be interesting to talk about because uh, I don't know. I, I feel like I got like pretty far on it to a point where I was able to at least reduce the ridge one. Um, but uh, hmm. yeah. I can try. I don't think I, I would get far. I generally tend to steer clear of these very steep ones. <laughs> Because I'm like, yeah, my yeah. math, I, I haven't done in such a long time. But I think that um, just hearing you talk about it and how you're thinking through and setting it up actually mm -hmm. helps to clarify the question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, because like, yeah, they tell you that like the intercept is zero. Right. So, so you can just kind of remove that from the, mm -hmm. the problem from the statement and then you're left with, Anyway, so yeah, I tried to like make the terms common through the identities they gave in the in the problem, um, and then tried to reduce it as much as possible and to see where I was like left with by the end. And in the ridge case, it was something like very simple with like one term, um, and then that you wanted to like make as close to zero as you could. Um, mm -hmm. um, so. But yeah, I basically did that one. I did number like the first few in conceptual and that one and um, mm -hmm. the first one in the plot. But I don't know, uh, Sandra, is there anything that you? No, I just had a, a question. Um, this is kind of a chapter wise, it might be naive, but so does, you know, Lasso, because it does do feature selection, is it related to either the, uh, you know, forward stepwise or backward stepwise in the way that it calculates these things? The chat does say something about it. It says that, um, you remember that the lasso was equivalent to um, doing the uh, constrained least squared that was in the book somewhere? Mm -hmm. Where'd my PDF go? And they said that the last, the, um, the the subset restriction, the uh, subset um, selection mm -hmm. was also a, can be thought of as a constrained linear regression where the constraint was like some kind of thing, which I can't what it was, and I'm trying to find it. I'll try to find the page, at least you can look at it. Oh, here it is. Um, page 243 at the bottom. Okay. Well, here, maybe I'll just, it just says basically, yeah, it's subject to, uh, using an indicator variable, um, basically that some of the variables are zero, I guess. So, two forty-three. Okay. Yeah, at the bottom there. I'm getting there. Um, so it makes a close connection between your lasso ridge and best subset selection. That okay, that that makes more sense. Yeah, I think I th I was thinking of this in in the wrong way because I think with those stepwise selections, you always either you know eliminate one or start with one, and then you tend to keep the subset right. Whereas yeah. I think with the best subset selection, you can replace some of the um, let's just say you know best estimates um, if the next one gives you a better 
uh, yeah. result, which makes more sense in terms, at least conceptually, that the lasso would work that way as opposed to, you know, stepping forward or backwards. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I also think like uh, that makes sense with lasso and subset regression and not the forward and backward selection because the forward mm -hmm. and backward selection isn't going to be the full sample space. Um, right. 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 So, like, I imagine like lasso is you're able to kind of based on uh, the lambda you choose and um, your data, like you're a, you, it could potentially eliminate any combination or keep any combination of variables, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, depending on the, the situation. So, I mean, even right there, right? Like it seems very much more similar to um, subset than forward or backward. Cause like, depending on the order that you, uh, or like, I don't know how the variables like interact with each other as you're removing or adding them, you would, you're going to miss part of the sample space. Uh, although now that you say that, it seems like the examples where they did do the last. So it looks like, you know, they plot like, like that plot you showed where it showed like the very, the coefficients going to zero. Mm -hmm. It looks mm -hmm. like once they go to zero, they never come back. So whereas when you do full subset, sometimes, you know, a variable you eliminate might come back, right? Yeah. As you go yeah. to less variables. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe it is more of a forward type thing, but I don't know. Yeah. I, that was just me thinking aloud, so that's always embarrassing. But <laughs> hey, well, I was I was trying to worth. do math. I was doing math aloud a second ago, and that was <laughs> that's worse, yeah. so. I think it's great. I think it's great because it's always very helpful. It's it's illuminating to like hear other people's yeah. Thinking through yeah. things because it really does help. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm comfortable with you all. So, and yeah. whoever else is following us on YouTube, uh, right? Our, our dedicated fans. So. <laughs> um okay i think that's everything oh you're doing next time right kevin yeah yeah i can do okay. um i'll do seven um yeah and i signed up post... for the trees uh Ooh, tree cool. methods tree based yeah. methods let's just quickly glance at the um schedule uh just mm -hmm. yeah I'll share it one second um oops all right. Yeah. So I have seven um, here. I mean, I can I can do this, but I like how we've been doing this. Bring your own question. So I'll like okay. finish up anything that I don't finish up, and then yeah, I think that's good. That's a good style. Leave with questions if I have any. I'll try to come up with some. Um, but then, Sandra, you got that? Okay, cool. Um, mm -hmm. And then we don't have any more for nine, but that's fine. Um, uh, when is that? Nine eleven. I might do this just because um, I'm starting this certificate thing program that starts like mid September, and I am not sure how much I can commit to present present uh, presenting wise um, mm -hmm. for that. Okay. So I'll try to front load a little bit my stuff. Um, but this one, I'm I'm pretty excited about this. Uh, like the survival analysis sensor data, I think that's a cool chapter. Because um, uh, I, I think I just, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Because I, I hadn't heard much about sensor data, especially um, and Teddy Models just recently did a lot of like work on uh, additions to accommodate censored data, censored modeling situations. And what is so censored like, data? Censored. So what mm -hmm. it, you ask what it is? Um, mm -hmm. My understanding of it is like when you, it's like if you have a a data set where there's like a there's like a range, like a true range, but that in your data above a certain threshold it gets like capped so like if oh. it's if if like you get above nine or something and everything above that is just is like nine instead uh -huh. of the true value i think that's the type of oh i see um yeah 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 um can you give me an example as to what kinds of data are like that Hey, I apologize, but I have to run. I'll, let, I'll leave you guys to uh, continue on yeah, yeah. the conversation. But no these guys, I appreciate the uh, learning opportunity, and I'll see you next time. All right. Thanks, Ron. All right. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Yeah, bye. Um, Kevin, right. if you have to go, don't let me keep you. No, I, I can stay for like a minute. Um, okay. Oh, this is, I don't like this explanation. Um, 
Okay, so left censoring a data point is below a certain value, but it's unknown by how much. Oh. Interval censoring a data point is somewhere on an interval between two values. Right censoring a data point is above a certain value, but it's unknown by how much. Oh, I didn't realize interval censoring was a part of that. That's interesting. Because, um, yeah, we do some like bucketing of, of data at work um, sometimes. And that's interesting that you can that you could use this for uh, that kind of situation too. I think what I was talking about was left and right censor censoring. Um, right, right, right. See what, like there's, see if there's cases here. Um, censor regression, let's see what's censored. Well, it says here that test scores are censored not by design, but by the bounds. They can't score above 100%, no matter how much more they know about the topic than others. Got it. That's interesting. Um, See, that's what I was wondering, if it's just, you know, a, a normal physical limit, or is it something in the evaluation method, right? Because, mm -hmm. for example, like I was thinking of, um, if you're looking at concentrations of something, sometimes your standard curve only goes, you know, certain orders of magnitude. So you could potentially have stuff that is outside of that, but you cannot rely on that measurement anymore. And so I guess you would cap it at the top value of the range of the standard curve that you're using. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay, that, that yeah. is cool, I see. But now with that bucketing example or the interval example, that makes a lot of sense because, um, yeah, because like that it's a common thing to do in like um and like my world of of site reliability is like people will instead of collecting like raw latency estimates, they'll they'll bucket mm -hmm. them. And then the last they'll so like so you'll have a bunch of account for a number of observations in different buckets, and then the last bucket also is gonna be everything above that uh yeah. That yeah. last so like so like you don't really you really have no idea how far it is from the boundary. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious how you even go about correcting for that like like if you have a boundary condition like that, how do you know how high it could be like right uh, right yeah like if the if super long tail like you could be you know 10 times that boundary you know like. Um, that that is true, yeah. Would you have a distribution, like a probability distribution? Not always, and definitely not for everything. So yeah, I mean, in my case, like we do have the raw observation, so like we could right. could reconstruct it, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, but uh, I mean, I'm just super curious about that chapter. Um, yeah, yeah, I've done survival analysis just in terms of you know like exactly as it says right you know you will have a cancer model or something and then you see how many animals survive after a certain point so i i'm familiar with how you plot that but given that it's a whole chapter i'm like oh there seems to be a lot more to it than you know the little bit that i know so yeah yeah um yeah maybe i'll try to present it if like i have time but uh it might be tough i'm taking two classes for this uh, certificate program that starts September 13th, I think. Oh, uh, nice. Are you, what What is it on? Is it? It's, yeah, so it's this program and a UVM. Um, this here. Um, so there's this complex system center and they have, um, they have a few different like options you can choose but there's this uh, online five course like graduate certificate uh -huh. um in complex systems and data science so um um yeah so you take like uh, modeling complex systems principles of complex systems a data science class and then you can take like anything here like uh, chaos theory networks um uh oh wow okay all, all kinds of cool stuff and yeah. It's like online and I, at some point I might want to do the masters too, but you can use these credits from the certificate to do, to do a masters. Um, and I've, I've had an interest in a while about like, uh, just kind of 
on the side or casually, I guess, in complex systems. So be mm -hmm. I thought it'd be fun to solidify that with like a formal set of courses, so. I see, yeah, 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 definitely. So, yeah, it's in a really neat like place. Um, they have, yeah, they have uh, University of Vermont. They have like, they have mm -hmm. a master's, PhD, um, yeah. Oh, that is interesting. And this is it, all offered online? Maybe I should look into some of these. The masters, um, mm -hmm. I think right now is not online, but they were thinking, they were trying okay. to get there. Um, uh -huh. But um, I hope they figure it out soon because I once I do the certificate, I might want to do the masters at some point, but. Um, yeah. But uh, so, like you do data science, right? As part of your yeah. the work that you do, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I'm wondering if I need to like finally do linear algebra or something, because <laughs> I'm like I always get into you know any sort of you know class that I've taken, um, and then they'll say like, oh, you know, go and watch some videos on linear algebra. But I'm like, yeah, but that's not the same as understanding it, you know. And it seems like so much of this. Is dependent upon that that I'm like oh, maybe I should just do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I I mean I was in like I started out in college thinking I would want to major in math and then mm -hmm. got interested in other things, but then I had taken right. enough courses that I was like, all right, I'll just take a few more to get a minor. Um, and right. And I thought I would never like think about it again. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and like when I took those classes, they weren't ever with the eye on like application. So right. Um, so like right. it wasn't clear why they were important or how they'd be used. And um and so like right now I'm like going through this process of trying to bring up that knowledge again and like refresh it a little bit. And um and like because like I'm like, oh wow, like all this is so useful for. Um, especially like linear algebra, like you said, um, yeah. for in like some calculus for um, a lot of these statistical and machine learning methods, and especially yes. if you really want to understand, understand how they're working. And I do, and yeah. I'm trying to like figure out what the right way is to like refresh all of that, but uh, without having to relearn everything. Um, yeah. But I think yeah. it's it's still there somewhere, but I'm like, but anyway, but it's like a similar process I'm going through. Um, and part of the reason why I wanted to do that certificate was to like force myself to come back to that math and- um, right. Right, and, right, right. And really, really understand it at that level, so. Um, right. Actually, you know, like um, how deep you and Ron get into the math almost makes mm -hmm. me excited about the math again. You know what I mean? Cool. Whereas sometimes I just like, I wanna ignore that part. <laughs> But I'm like, no, no, I should like really pay attention to what these symbols mean. And I think, you know, it's slowly starting to come back because I haven't done, you know, like formal math since my undergrad days, which has been a long time. So, yeah, I mean, kind of kind of me, too. And um, mm -hmm. like I, I Ron is amazing. He uh, he yeah. he really is is fluent in this stuff. And I um, I'm, I'm just trying to like be able to talk through everything and, and like converse about it and like um, you know, and, and start to work through some of the, these proofs. Um, mm -hmm. And just like, but the hardest part for me is like getting over the, the stage where I'm like, where I'm like, like scared to dive into the, the symbols and the math. And like, yes. I, I feel that yes. way. I yes. feel that way too. And, um, but like, just being able to like talk through what it's saying, um, mm -hmm. you know, and what all, like everything, you know, it's just the language, everything has a meaning mapped on to, onto it. And, um, and if you do it like step by step, it becomes less, less scary. But, um, but anyway, yeah, like I, I'm trying to like constantly overcome that, that barrier. Um, a large part of it does feel like emotional, but. Um, right, 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 right. But you know what, I, I think that you have a, a great intuition for it and then also for communicating it. Um, because sometimes I'm like, I don't know what Ron is talking about, but then you'll sort of translate it for me, right? And I'm like, okay, I think I get it now. Yeah. So thanks. Um thanks. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm just trying to think aloud, but uh thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. So um it was interesting because uh when I first started analyzing, you know, like uh, um it's like transcriptomics, right? So like RNA uh, 
quantification type things. I was working with someone who is an electrical engineer that is going into this kind of modeling, right? Mm -hmm. And I was trying to explain the method without me fully, you know, like I read the the DC, it's, it's what it's called, um, mm -hmm. paper. It's one of the more popular packages for analyzing like RNA-seq data. And I was just like, oh my God, you know, it's all math. And so he spoke in math and I was like, I'm having trouble trying to communicate what it is that we're trying to get out of this. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But I think that, you know, slowly and just either reading more or getting more acquainted with this or going through like now the ISLR, I'm like, I think that I'm a bit better at it and even understanding, you know, like how they were modeling all of those mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay, slowly, you know, slowly, I think I'm, I'm getting like a, like a solid, you know, yeah, even if it's yeah. baby steps. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that's the way to do it. Like you do, you know, a little bit at a time, like whether it's like knowing what all the symbols like represent or, right. or, you know, just starting to manipulate things. And then I think before you know it, you're like, you're doing, you're doing math and then it's like no longer a barrier, you know? And um, yes, like, yes. I, th I feel like I'm like getting close to where it feels like normal again to like write right that. right um, right right um yes but, yes you know because I'm like you know like right out of high school and then going into like you know early undergrad I was like I was fluent in this I knew it you know so it has yeah. to be there recoverable so yeah def yeah. definitely yeah like I like I loved uh I loved calculus when I was in high school and like early mm -hmm. college um mm -hmm. and then I took multivariable and like I I really struggled in that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if it was the the topic or the professor, but like I, I went from like like really being solid to like you know a B minus or something in multivariable, and like I was, uh, yeah, I don't know. That kind of discouraged me from from going further in the math track. Um, right. The time, but, yeah. but I don't know now that like there's a clear application and like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like there's a benefit like to a uh, real world problem solving um, yes like yes. It, it's much more interesting to me again but um like there's this there's this method uh later in the book called matrix completion um uh -huh. and i started watching videos on it because uh it's actually in the causal inference community they're they're starting to use it as a method to like um like it's basically like when you have a situation where you have a bunch of like everyone seems to use the same example of like um netflix recommendations so like when right you, right you have a, a a huge matrix with like uh partially complete data so you have like all the all people in rows and movies and columns um and if you or sorry mm -hmm. other way around i think movies in rows and people in columns or something like okay. that and you and you um you don't know like person a may have rated movies a b and c person b may have rated b c and d but you don't mm -hmm. know what person b's rating would be for a you know movie a right right anyway so it's like a uh a, a way to and it actually sounds a lot like pca in some ways um like reducing like this huge matrix down to uh, a set of common uh patterns and then filling in the missing data based on those um those patterns and like anyway but the, oh, the process is like this whole like matrix factorization thing and um and and uh and like i'm pretty sure i learned something about that in linear algebra but like mm -hmm. now i like now i'm like i really want to understand that it's actually later in the it's later in the book um i think it's like chapter 11 or 12 or something like that um right right maybe 12 uh or maybe it's later not sure but um i know it's in the book somewhere um so for that one like it's very clear like you're working with a matrix like you use mm -hmm. linear algebra to, to kind of get at the um the, this the kind of impute these missing values um mm -hmm. so i thought that was like a really good case where you could like review okay so it's in chapter 12 it's like 12 5 2 um uh -oh. where you can like that? review review these methods in linear algebra and then like um and then try to understand that method like step by step um right 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 it's, it's directly yeah. linear algebra um 
So. I may have to try and uh, review then some of that prior to. Um, you know what's actually useful? Um, you know how, I mean, now there's so much available on YouTube. So there's this channel. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called Three Blue, One Brown. And um, uh, I was just, that's, I was just watching those videos. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going yeah. back because I watched some of those videos. It was for a, a neuro 299, you know, graduate level course that was looking at a lot of this modeling stuff. And so some of it we had to cover, you know, like basis vectors and transformations and stuff like that. So I watched some of those videos, but I think I'm going to go back and watch the whole thing because um, it's just so intuitive, like the way that is presented. And in, you know, very short, like five to 10 minute thing. So it's very digestible, like at once. Um, and so I'm like, you know, like, I guess nowadays we have the advantage of that there's all of this material out there, you know, that is mm -hmm. uh, made so much more intuitive than just like when I learned that it was all textbook based, right? So. Yeah, um, yeah, me, me too. That definitely didn't exist. I, I love his videos from what I've seen so far. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I watched the first one on linear algebra and then like, um, cause someone on, I was looking online, like for like, what are courses or resources for someone in my position where like mm -hmm. you may have taken it, but it was like over mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Um, right. and you want to like be re-familiarized with some of these concepts and of uh, someone, a bunch of people mentioned this guy, this guy's yes. channel. So, um, yes. and they have like hundreds of thousands of views and I'm like, that's amazing mm -hmm. that someone is getting that kind of traffic for linear algebra. <laughs> right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. And then I was like, oh, there's also a calculus series. Maybe I should look through the whole thing, refresh yeah. myself. So yeah. I want to look through that one too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that, that, that's great. Because um, I, I had heard about it and then I was just like, you know, how popular is it? Sometimes, you know, it comes recommended to me. So I'm like, oh, it seems like it's super popular, you know, but mm -hmm. that's just the YouTube algorithm. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, cool. All right. Well, thanks, Kev. Thanks for staying and, and chatting. It's always good to know, like, uh, you know, what are the resources you're looking into? Because um, yeah, I yeah. have some ideas. Yeah. I, I love hearing that as well. Um, yeah. It's cool that we're kind of in a similar place of like, like, you know, uh, deconstructing the math in here and um i i found that this book is actually a good like on ramp to that it seems right. like yeah. they present the math but it's not all about the math like you can still get what they're trying to get at without completely understanding every piece of lines of math they have but like but you can also uh, use it as like a, a place to start to uh you know um like we were saying, like the literacy part and um, yeah, and yeah, working through things by hand and um, kind of as a way to start to get to more complex uh, the the grittier stuff and uh, you know for how these methods work. So yeah, yeah, I I definitely agree. I also like the way that it's written because it's slightly less you know formal, more colloquial sometimes, and mm -hmm. I like being talked to that way. So. Yeah, yeah. But don't don't give me like ultra formal language that seems archaic. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Cool. Okay, right. cool. I'll see you next week Thanks. then. Yeah, see you next week. Have a good one. Bye bye. bye.